But let's go, I want to go to Tanya Broder, because if you could speak to, one, the sanctuary bill that was just passed, and then perhaps also refer to some of the other bills that are pending with the governor that could affect schools. So Tanya Broder. Sure. Um, well, I'm happy to say that the governor has signed today 11 immigrant inclusive bills protecting um, immigrant rights in the workplace, tenants, um, right? Um, limiting the, pri the role of private uh, contractors with uh, immigrant detention in California and protecting, uh, making, helping to make sure that K through 12 schools as well as colleges, healthcare facilities, public libraries and other entities um, are um, protect the rights of all all school all students, patients, and other people seeking services in California to the almost to the greatest degree possible. These immigrant inclusive policies are a reflection of what California thinks about the people who live and work and contribute to our communities, and um, it's it's our part, right? Doing our part um, to make places safe, inclusive, and mutually supportive because our lives are interconnected. Immigrants and citizens live in families together, we live in communities together, and we make California great. So, um, the, the the safe haven, po the attorney general is now charged with developing model policies for all those entities. This is under both the California Values Act and under um, AB 699, which is one of the bills that passed today. Um, so it will actually mandate that schools adopt either a model policy or an equivalent to make sure that, um, and really those model policies help schools comply with their federal legal obligations to make sure that all students have um, access to a public K through 12 education under a Supreme Court case called Plyler versus Doe, that their civil rights are protected. One of the bills, AB 699, also adds immigration status to the protected grounds for uh, anti-discrimination claims that people can make. Um, and privacy laws, federal and state, like the uh, FERPA law that protects uh, the privacy of students' educational records. So, um, but Tanya, yes. can I just ask you, you about the, the sanctuary bill that passed today? My yeah. understanding is most of that dealt with the criminal detainer issue. So, uh, uh, is there something in there that would, uh, could affect schools? Absolutely, there are two parts to that bill. One part of the bill further limits California's Invol the involvement of, of state and local resources in federal immigration enforcement by preventing the state from um, responding to voluntary detention requests in most cases and um, notifications in some cases. So really limiting the role of local law enforcement agencies in federal immigration enforcement efforts. A second part of that same bill charges the Attorney General with developing model policies for schools, for healthcare facilities, for libraries, and for other entities to um, limit inquiries, to have a plan for if somebody requests access to the site, to make sure that um, the, uh, the um, Fourth Amendment rights of uh, students and patients are protected, and um, otherwise to protect the privacy of consumers in California. Well, ju just to clarify that mm -hmm. uh, there are these safe haven resolutions, is this in effect going to mandating that every district pass something like that? Bo is, the, is, together, is yes, together both Again, many, many schools already have some form of policy that helps ensure that all students have um, safe access and aren't asked unnecessary questions that chill access to schools and have other policies in place to make sure that students know their rights and have access to resources. These two bills actually codify those good practices so that um, they will actually be required to adopt some kind of policy that reinforces those principles. Can I just ask just the rest of the panel if anybody has a comment on this passage of the sanctuary bill? Uh, Shilin, I see uh, you. Of course yeah. I do. Um, I, I'm a local school board member, so um, I, I would say I, I applaud the legislature and the, and, and the governor for passing this, and I'm looking forward to every district adopting policies um, 
that will um, provide sort of the umbrella for, for safe haven school districts. But I will say what's more important is what happens after those policies were, are adopted. Um, we, heard, uh, we heard earlier talking about how when there was an audit of school policies in terms of enrollment, just even though we're not supposed to, many districts were still collecting social security numbers, many were asking immigration status. So um, I think it's very important if you're in a district, I know there's a lot of school members out there or, or working in a district, that as this rolls out in the next year, two years, um, that we're very thoughtful about w what we're changing internally as we adopt these policies. And could we just, uh, just to uh, comment on the DACA deadline today, I think you know, one of the things has been a lot of focus with the DACA recipients are on college students, but actually it's a minority of the DACA recipients are these college students that we've been reading about at UC Berkeley and other places, that uh, a lot of uh, DACA recipients in rural areas, uh, non-college students, and also some K, well, can't be K-12, but high school students who may have gotten uh, now, could, could you comment, I, did, I, did I hear this morning that only 70% of potentially eligible people who are eligible to reapply for the two-year extension is what we were talking about, uh, did only 70% 70, 70 applied, so there's 30% who, Mar as of March, they're, they're supportable. Yeah. Only a subset of the, um, so, all DACA recipients, if they have DACA now, when their DACA expires, the, the plan is that that's the end of their DACA grant. Um, there was a small subset, there was a subset of um, DACA grantees who were allowed just until today to, and these are people whose DACA expires on or before March 5th. So those are the folks who, there were maybe 150,000 of them, maybe 100,000 made it in by the deadline for various reasons. So we do have some people whose DACA will expire before March 5th. We don't know when. So, so, so you, if, you're, if you didn't reapply by today, and let's say your uh, waiver would, uh, expires December 1, that's it. Right? Yes, that's and there's some people who, you know, they were noticed, very complicated, but some people um, allowed their DACA to lapse briefly before September 5th, and those folks had no chance to reapply. They would normal. They would normally. They were given notices saying, "Oh, you have until X date to apply." But then, once this announcement came in, they may already have lost their DACA. And, and can I just ask you, Vito Chiala, principal at Overfeld High School, are you aware of any of your students having uh, this DACA exemption? You so, so at a school that's predominantly immigrant, we have uh, probably done probably written a hundred letters for DACA recipients over the last what, four years or so since it was adopted. Um, but I will tell you in the last eight months, there's been a tremendous fear about reporting anything to the federal government. And uh, even with reassurances from several of the community-based agencies, I hear students and families say that they'll just go back to how they used to do it before, which is underground. So that might be one reason that not everybody applied. They just didn't, well, don't trust the government to use this information because they'd have to give their most current addresses, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? Do you, you think that's one of the reasons that? I, I know for us it's a challenge to get them to trust us at the school level with information, whether that's a free and reduced lunch form. Um, and, and they have a high degree of trust in schools. And to, to turn information over to immigration agencies, they're not, most of them are skeptical about doing that at this point. That's what I hear. And could you just describe just your school? I mean, what, when you say predominantly immigrant, what, what is the? We have a little over 1,500 students, 92% qualify for free and reduced lunch. And I, of course, we don't gather information about immigration status, um, but we're more than 80% Latino, um, less than 2% white, and most of the students speak a language other than English. So, um, I, like I said, if I go back through my uh, letters of supporting DACA status in, uh, applications. I've done at least a hundred in the last three or four years. Uh, could you just explain that? Because I wasn't aware that the schools had a role in, in, the, in these applications. You, you had to certify that they were in school, is that, or is there, that? There's um, a lot of confusion around the process, but, but students have to demonstrate that they were attending a school consistently, and a lot of times parents want a letter uh, saying that they're in good standing at the school in support of their other documentation. Um, okay, so I just I just to step back for a minute. Uh, I mean, there have been a lot of, I'd say, more anecdotal reports about what impact these heightened uh, 
uh, enforcement policies uh, have had over the last nine months. But I will just have to say um, that, uh, as I think quite a few of you here know, that uh, President Obama was called uh, deporter in chief mm -hmm. uh, by the National Council of La Raza. And so uh, two and a half million uh, immigrants were uh, undocumented immigrants were deported during his eight years of office and more, and more than any other period. So um, this, we're talking about heightened enforcement, but uh, I think there's been a lot of fear already before that. But so we're not just talking about what happened after you know January 20th. But uh, let me turn to you, uh, Oscar Cruz, about um, anecdotal reports about what impact this has had in schools. Parents afraid to take their kids to school. Parents afraid to participate in school activities. Uh, anxieties among my kids themselves. And you, you're working with families. Uh, yeah, what, uh, what, what have you seen and what are you seeing? You know, thank you first of all for uh, in, uh, inviting us to talk about this topic. And uh, you know, I, I, I think it's very real. Um, the fear and anxiety in our community. And I think I wanna say this very clearly in terms of nowadays we really don't sometimes know what's real and what's not with fake news. News is not fake news, folks. Our families are living in a, in, a, in a moment where they have to make a decision. Should I go to the park today? Because I just don't know if today maybe something's gonna happen and a raid is gonna happen. I heard yesterday from someone that maybe the police was there the fear and anxiety of the families that we work is real and tremendous. Um, and you know, when I when I talk to uh, to families and the parent, I, I called uh, and I was talking to one of the parents in Spanish, and I love the phrase that she she gave me in Spanish. She said, "Andamos con una gran psicosis." Uh, we're in a state in a psychotic state. We're looking over our shoulders. We don't know what to do. We don't know what's real anymore in terms of who's asking us information for what. Um, I, I had the chance to talk to the Mexican consulate. I was at a, meet a meeting at the Mexican consulate. The Mexican government had assigned money for the consulates to refund and actually pay uh, for the uh, uh, DACA students to apply. So they would actually, the Mexican government will refund the families that, uh, that fee. She said, I had 10 people come. The Mexican consulate in LA, the second largest population of Mexican um, population outside of Mexico, couldn't get the own folks to come in and get information about this in the sense of, uh, and, and that I think that, that reflects around the fear and anxiety that, that, that we're living. Um, we're seeing it very clearly in a, in a couple of ways. One is that we have seen definitely a drop in the number of attendance, in the attendance that families are going to after school programs. Uh, 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 we're seeing a drop in attendance in, in, in kids going to school. I've, I've talked to two large uh, charter uh, management organizations in LA and someone in LAUSD and they say, look, I can't put my thing, I can't give you a number, but I am 100% uh, assured that attendance is being affected by what's happening in our communities. Um, even completing the California Dream Act, uh, the ability for them, for students to apply for uh, financial aid in California, which has nothing to do the, with the federal government, um, uh, the families are in, living in a, in a constant uh, state of fear. Uh, and I think that that, that, um, uh, that is very serious. I think that, that it, and it is happening across, um, uh, across the schools. I, in areas like Los Angeles, I think that where we have a lot of political leadership that knows how important this is, there's a lot of uh, messaging around, you know, we do care, this is important, uh, but it's not, a, it's not like that across the whole state. You know, uh, not every district is like LA, and obviously we know areas like Inland Empire, Central Valley, there's a lot, a lot of support that uh, those, those communities need. So, uh, and for families and schools, uh, we work with families in two different ways. Uh, we obviously are involved in advocacy, ensuring that their voices are heard uh, both at the state level and uh, local ed uh, ed ed education decision making. But we do a lot of capacity building and professional development um, for both the professional, for the educators and for the parents on how to build those partnerships. But I just wanna make sure that I, I convey that message because when I talk to parents, uh, you can see it. You can see it in their face, you can see it in the students' faces uh, and how that is impacting you know, their mental state. 
I wanted to go to Elida Bautista, who has been working with the Mission Promise Neighborhoods, uh, trauma-informed uh, work. Um, what are you seeing, and then what does that mean at, around the trauma-informed sure. uh, interventions? So I'm a clinical psychologist by training, uh, and I've been working with uh, four different schools in the Mission District of San Francisco with this Healthy Environments and Response to Trauma is the name of the program through UCSF. Um, and our goal is to promote safe, equitable learning environments through this trauma-informed consultation. So not about just you know, fixing a kid or addressing one kid or sending in a therapist, but rather trying to create change in the culture and climate of the school. Um, and so a lot of what Oscar is saying resonates with what I'm seeing. Um, you know, what you're describing is part of, you know, the PTSD syndrome around hypervigilance, right? Um, with PTSD, you have uh, the, the essential element is a threat to livelihood for the individual or for their caregiver, right? If we're thinking about kids depending on their parents um, for their own survival. And so, you know, potentially the threat of deportation uh, is that threat of livelihood for some kids who, or parents who have experienced the traumas in the course of migration, um, that in it, the threat of deportation could in itself be a trigger for um, the flashbacks, the reminders of the trauma that they experienced in that, in that process. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our families also live in compromised communities in terms of um, exposure to, to community violence or other violence, and so um, they might have some vulnerabilities already in place I see a lot of anxiety. You know, there's policies around, you know, cell phone use in class, right? But if you're worried about your parents not going to be there, um, you might not want to come to school, right? So you might have school ref refusal. You might have some social uh, separation anxiety where we're just having kids not want to leave the parents' side. But that cell phone is a proxy, too. And so there's policies that are important for the learning environment, right? But that might also be... Um, impacting how that kid presents behaviorally, why they might be putting up more of a fight or an outburst when the teacher tries to, to take the cell phone, right? So what we might see is a behavioral fallout around, um, you know, out of classroom time or suspensions if, if folks don't know what the story is behind it. And I think, you know, like Shilonin mentioned, the importance of, um, you know, what does the practice look like on the ground once we have these policies in place? So even having some, uh, you know, transparency around the policies and a clear understanding and training for the staff on, uh, um, you know, how to respond if there is contact from ICE uh, could be one of those issues where we've seen um, kind of hiccups, right? When there's been rumors of ICE raids, we have a lot of anxiety in the community. Um, the rumors have gone so far as, you know, grocery stores or bus stops, right? So if our, our parents are bringing their, school, their kids to school, on the bus or sending them on the bus on their own, um, they're keeping them from school on those days, right? Because there have been rumors in the past. And so now even if the ice raid rumor is um, that it's on the corner of this or th uh, that highway, they still choose, you know, well, they might show up at the bus stop too, so we're just not gonna send them today. And we'll get calls saying they're not coming for this reason. But, um, you know, it's created this whole anxiety across the community where um, the responsibility of having to uh, clarifies, you know, some of the rumors come, falls onto the school staff to help parents understand or, or know what the threat actually is. Um, but even the threat of ICE showing up to school and what do you do when that happens uh, has, has been something that has been uh, had to figure out after it occurred, right? And so um, the need for that level of safety and predictability by, by everybody in the school including parents, staff, and kids knowing what would happen if, you know, that, that principals and administration and staff will protect them and not let ice onto the grounds. Um, you know, that was, that was a piece of like, logistically, what does that look like when they show up at the door? Who is that, you know, security guard person or the attendance clerk that's gonna, um, you know, stop the ice person at the door and, and how would they communicate to the principal whose office is, you know, way in there to come out to the door, right? So it's like that level of specificity on the ground, what it looks Ms. like. Lila, could I just ask you, when you talk about trauma, let's say with the, I can see with an immigrant kid who's had a flee with their parents, uh, that would be 
traumatic event, but let's say a US citizen student, um, tra traumatic events if they're living in a, in a neighborhood with a lot of violence, but what, is there also trauma around the immigrant sure. issue, even if you're a US citizen born? If they're yeah. are in a household that's mixed status, Right, um, so if there's still threat of deportation for their parents, even if they're US citizens, we are seeing increases in anxiety um, and a traumatic response, um, especially if they've actually experienced raids or have witnessed it or you know, heard from a neighbor or community member. Um, you know, there's the, the raids can be pretty graphic and um, traumatic, so wow. yeah. We I'm going to come to you just in a second about what you're seeing in your school uh, in, in terms of what other panelists are reporting, but Tanya, could you just clarify what the actual risk of a raid on a school campus is and the, the sensitive locations policy? I think that would be helpful. Sure, yeah. sure. So for several decades, the Department of Homeland Security, or INS, had a policy which it still says it follows, which is that um, it avoids enforcement action on or near sensitive locations, which include K through 12 schools, which actually, which includes schools at every level, whether it's a primary school, K through 12, or higher ed. Um, so their general practice and their commitment has been not to enforce, uh, to engage in enforcement actions on or near campuses. Um, uh, and for the most part, it's true, they do hold by that. It's, it's an unlikely event for them to come onto campus unless they're you know, chasing somebody uh, in the moment. Um, we have certainly seen instances where there have been enforcement actions near schools or when someone's been dropping somebody off. And it only takes one little um, incident to create a whole lot of anxiety and fear. And, I, and I, so I do wanna say, so it is unlikely, it is helpful um, like you say, to prepare very concretely for you know what do you do and practice what you do, and so everyone feels like they're prepared for an, what I would consider to be an unusual emergency. Um, if you do see, if someone does violate that policy, though, it really is also up to all of us to hold them accountable, and that is something we have seen uh, to be effective even under this administration, which is to publicly call out of those kind of violate. It's not, it's not a. It's a guidance document. It's not something you could really litigate, but you can call people out publicly. And when we have called out the administration publicly for kind of skirting around those guidances, they have kind of stepped up and said, no, no, that's not our policy. We won't do it. And advocacy has even helped um, parents who've been caught up in, in those uh, instances. So it is really worth all of us to be prepared, but also to be eyes and ears and a public voice for why this is a bad policy um, to the extent that it happens. So, um, but okay. it is something I think that is a general commitment. Yeah, but as you, as we've now just talked about, even though the ICE age, very unlikely that they will actually come onto the campus, but even a raid in the proximity of a school would, could have an impact on school attendance and participation in uh, school activities. Definitely. So, Vito Chiara, what are you seeing in terms of anxiety, in terms of attendance? Um, at your school? It's really interesting because everything each of the panelists has said is, is what we're experiencing every day with our families. Um, and we can go back to prior to this administration with the number of deportations we were seeing in the last three or four years with, you know, dad's not home and mom's got to raise the family because dad was deported. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to start a campaign about knowing how to support undocumented students as a staff. I'd say three years ago or so, and we built our capacity to do that, which made our school community more prepared as we came into this last year, which has been really intense. Um, and there is the real threat, because there have been deportations. And then there are these imagined threats, these rumors of raids that are happening that spread through social media and make everybody want to keep their kids home, including students who are documented who are afraid they're going to get picked up by accident. Um, and then there's just this perceived value, and I would say under the previous administration, although the raids were happening, there wasn't this devaluing of the community, and the community right now is feeling like, like this society on the bigger level doesn't value them. Um, and so that is putting them into places where we really have to show that we do value our community, our immigrant community, everybody who comes to our schools and lives around us. Um, the, the last thing I would say yeah, but is- Can I just clarify, are, are you seeing like, 
lower attendance? Are you seeing kids needing more mental health services? Are you seeing or parents not wanting to attend parent teacher conferences? Are you, are you, we, we're, yeah. we're, we're seeing that and then we're responding to it. And so our attendance did drop last year by about a half a percent of ADA and we can attribute some of that uh, to immigrant families right. keeping their kids out of school after a raid. And we know we have to, re we, our DREAM Act applications were down by about 30% from the year before. Um, and we're knowing we have to respond. And so after a, a raid rumor that we had in our community, uh, we did a school-wide lesson uh, where staff did a close reading of a board resolution to keep ICE off campus. Um, I went on the intercom and made a message to parents about how they're not allowed on our campus. Our campus is a sanctuary place and our staff has a protocol in place if somebody was to show up. What we would do to keep ICE off until the superintendent and our lawyers came. Um, and I think just them knowing that we put that much time and energy uh, into making sure they knew our school was a sanctuary for them and their families um, has allowed us to counter some of that uh, fear that we were seeing in the community. One of the things anecdotal again that, that there were that families didn't want their students to participate in the school free and reduced price meal. Uh, did anybody anybody see that? And then I, I'm going to ask you, Shalanine, about what you're seeing in Azusa. Yeah. So I mean, I'll respond to that. I mean, I think, um, and I, I mean, I, I can only speak about my own context in Azusa. I think. Um, I think that knowing that that's a concern, we have gone out of our way to, to assure our families, to have them understand what that data is used for, where it goes, how it's being shared, um, so that we can allay those concerns. So really, I mean, within our district, I feel like we've done a good job of really communicating that with our, community, with our families so they understand this. Um, and so I, so I can't like say yes or no anecdotally with that piece, but I can't, I'll give you another example. Um, t last week I was talking to, to a, a teacher at a high school um, asking about, you know, what's happening with the students. And um, she um, said that the, the students really appreciated the fact that the day after the DACA decision happened on, on um, September 5th, our superintendent sent out a letter. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give credit to Oakland because I saw Oakland did it and I sent it to our superintendent and, I said, and she's, like, oh, she's like, okay, I'm gonna do this too. So, um, so we, she sent that out and the students knew that. The students knew that and told the teacher that they felt really good that she was sending out a message to our whole community that responding to what, what, what the, the Trump administration had done the day before. Um, so it's things like that that we can do to make our families feel welcome. Um, and we need to continue doing things like that. You know, I, um, I tend to say, you know, it, it's, it, the good thing is that discrimination against immigrants is gonna end at the end of this pres presidential term, <laughs> right? It's a joke, <laughs> right? But, but, but I, I say that because tongue in cheek, because I think we have to also take a step back to recognize that uh, it's, it's not gonna end, nor, nor did it start with the current president, right? And I'm talking about beyond just uh, raids and, and deportations, I'm talking about what most of the panels were talking today uh, in the morning, which is the state of the, the climate, the school climate, and whether students and families feel safe whether they feel discriminated, uh, whether they feel accepted. And I think that it's important for us to take that step back to recognize that for a very long time, our families, immigrant, low income, communities of color, have uh, been in situations where they're being pushed out out of the school system. So to me, I think that this is also an opportunity for us to know that while we are reacting to these bigger issues of immigration, the, the, the toxic political environment, um, that there's a lot bigger issues about school culture that we have to address. And, um, you know, for me, I think that what, what we are hearing from parents is that it's very important for, first, short term, is that the administration has to communicate that they're supportive, right? Is that empathy to say, yes, you know, we understand what you're going through and we want to protect, we want to help you. Uh, that's, you know, connecting them to legal resources, to student resources. But when we start looking at more long-term changes in, this, in, in the area of school climate and, and um, in the area of the environment, we have to go back to the to issues of uh, where is funding going to support families? Where are the wraparound services uh, for parental engagement? Uh, we have to look at issues of professional development. Our issues, our competencies around social justice, around issues of cultural competency, uh, around empathy embedded within the professional development that we give 
you know, every single staff, every single teacher. So, you know, I was, uh, those are the questions to me that are more important. How are we gonna really, uh, you know, address and make real many of these policies that are, are, that are passing into day-to-day -day realities for the families? And sure. uh, yeah. I quickly, before uh, the, uh, I jumped here on the panel, I looked at the uh, LCAP for LAUSD, and I'm not picking up, on, uh, picking on LAUSD, this is across the board. I looked at what was the allocation on parental engagement in their 2005, 2000, uh, 2015, 2016 school year. Uh, it was around $5 million. How, how much do you think, how big is the LAUSD budget for LCFM? Several billion. Yeah. Six billion. So that, those are the questions about how are we connecting what we're saying to the actual on the ground investments that are going to create active parent centers, professional development, wraparound services. So I think to me that that's the gap that is existing bef between the narrative, which could stay at more of a PR messaging level to actually impacting uh, the families that we're, we're working with. Can I just go quickly to yeah. Elida? Uh, you're from UCSF. I'm assuming your salary is paid by UCSF. Well, uh, it's all. Uh, UCSF is all um, year-to-year -year contracts and okay. grants, so it's not, uh, I don't have like a permanent salary. But the services that you provide, I mean, how widespread are those in schools? Uh, uh, well, the services I'm providing to uh, are paid through the Mission Promise Neighborhoods contracting UCSF to mm -hmm. come in. And so we have another psychologist in seven schools in the Bayview also providing trauma-informed That's practices. a federal, federal grant, right? The Promise Neighborhoods? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, so we have a number of donors in philanthropy that have allowed us to do this work over uh, since 2008 in, in San Francisco School District. But would it be fair to say that this is not available right. across school yeah. districts right. across California? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Or even in the Bay Area, right? Right, yeah. even in the Bay but Area. But just to note, you know, I think that uh, there are great districts who are investing a lot. So, I, you know, the work that Shiloline and Asusa and, uh, and others are doing, there, there, is, uh, there are districts, uh, districts who are investing their LCAP money. So I, but I just wanted to say something about that because yes, we don't all have promise initiatives in our in our communities. I think we wish we had that mu that many resources. But the state does provide some baseline um, supports. I'm not an expert in, in in health access, but many of our immigrant communities are also low income communities, and so they are eligible and they're mixed status. So even if you even if you're undocumented as a as a child, you're eligible for he free health care. Um, and so, as districts, we need to make sure that our families understand their access rights and are accessing those rights. But I would also stay because in many of our communities, we also have stigmas around se seeking mental health help that we have to work to address that and make families understand. And maybe, Elida, you can talk about this. Make them understand that, that these supports only help you and make you be stronger as a person. Sure. I'm just going to, okay. uh, we have to watch the time, <laughs> respectful of people. And this is. Well, this is also so important to the whole of California, but I just wanted to ask Tanya, because the issue here of schools, kids not, parents not wanting to bring the kids to school, anxieties, lack of services. Uh, my understanding is that schools can't just say, well, we can't deal with that. That's not our responsibility. Don't they have a constitutional obligation? I mean, particularly for undocumented kids to make sure that do what they have to do to so get kids to school. Well, as as we've uh, the the backdrop for all of this is the Plyler versus Doe 1982 decision that requires um, that that uh, gives each child a constitutional right to attend K through 12 school regardless of their immigration status, regardless of the immigration status of their parents. So all of the safe school policies that we're talking about are uh, one method of ensuring that schools comply with that. Uh, constitutional obligation along with the other legal um, rights that students have to privacy or to be free from discrimination. I think that the points that were made earlier though really um, are, <laughs> are very important, which is you know, how do you make those concrete? What do you do? What does that mean? Um, and I think some of the other work that we've done, as you pointed out, in, in California, in making sure that all kids have access to Medi-Cal if they're a low-income family, regardless of their status, that there are other services that are available without regard to status um, are very important. In, um, and that schools and the money that has been invested 
in access to legal services by the state of California, and so then the trick is to connect the dots, to make sure that on the ground, um, folks are aware of the resources that are available and find a way to make those, uh, th those rights real for the families in the way that you guys know best. So, um, so yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a legal right that the schools are bound to um, comply with, and then after that, it's really a matter of how they do it. Can we just, I, and, uh, and really, we, this is a, so important a topic, and we, this, we could talk for another hour, but then we're not gonna be able to. But if I could just go through the panel really quickly, if there's one thing that you think schools could do, because some of the, it's, there's so much that obviously could be done or should be done. Uh, just one thing, uh, the most important thing that you think uh, schools or school districts should be doing. Um, and Peter, is there anything from your perspective? I mean, I think the most important thing goes to everything we've talked about today. It's about building uh, a school community that is inclusive, uh, relationship-based between staff, students, parents, and the community, and, and building their protections from that valuing of every student as an individual. Edina. Um, so it, thinking from a trauma lens and thinking about how trauma causes fragmentation and chaos, uh, the more that we can build in some predictability, uh, fostering trust in dependable relationships and reestablishing that for people, uh, the better that we'll be able to reduce some of that anxiety. And also thinking, you know, to Oscar's point, uh, thinking about racism and xenophobia as traumatic, as a threat to livelihood. Uh, for children of color and for undocumented kids is, is part of the thinking. So having some cultural humility, uh, having an understanding for the, what trauma does neurobiologically and how that shows up behaviorally will allow us to respond to it better and you know, um, foster some empowerment and collaboration. Oscar, one thing that uh, top of your list. Uh, we are uh, very firm believers that uh, we need to uh, invest on the professional development and human capital of the staff. Uh, schools are made up by staff. That's it's not just the building, it, it is the people who are in there. And if we start from that perspective about professional development and not making it an add-on, but really a part of what the competencies of quality uh, schooling is, I think that we'll get to, to the point where those relationships are built and then resources will follow because they will understand that there's resources needed. But it's changing mindsets. Shilin. So um, since I didn't mention earlier, I, I, I think that we as Californians together hope that um, districts will send somebody to our train that we'll be holding in January in San Mateo and LA County, um, where we'll be um, training um, staff on um, grade span age appropriate lessons um, that you can take back to your school district and have kids actually in classrooms have discussions about this issue in real and sensitive ways. And Tanya Broder, other than people calling you when they need help, <laughs> yeah. legal free advice. To, feel free to call me. I, I look forward to working with all of you in addition to all of the really good points that everyone has made about making your school as safe and free from discrimination, bullying, and everything else. Um, uh, really to support the leadership and to support, Give, send a message to the families and to the students you're there for them to support the leadership of young people who are fighting for a better country for us and to also be a voice um, because you know them best. Be another voice uh, in support of the rights of young people who live and have grown up here and deserve um, to be treated better. So I hope we, we can work with you on that. Um. I, would, I just really want to thank the panel, I mean, not for you, for you coming here today, but more, more importantly for your work, because this does seem like this really gets at the heart of what California is all about, not only California, but the country. And, uh, and you're dealing with these families, often marginalized, with very few resources, taking on the power of the United States government. Um, and uh, that's, that's a huge battle for people to fight on their own. So can we just give a round of applause to the people on the panel and their work?